So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Gina Della Barker from Show Me Shorts Film Festival in New Zealand. Uh, I'm also um, one of the board members for the Short Film Conference, which is your host today. We're um, very happy to be presenting a um, special short film conference online event called Going Viral. Uh, and today we'll be discussing online film festivals, which are a big issue for us all. Um, hopefully I'm going to learn some things and we're all going to share some knowledge, which is what the short film conference is all about. For those of you that are not yet members of the short film conference, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Um, the short film conference is a a network of people that work in the short film component of the screen industry and uh, we host a conference usually in Clermont Ferrand each year but we also um, put on networking events and educational events at short film festivals all around the world and uh, we're all about sharing information and uh, working together collaboratively to learn and um, bring ourselves closer together. That's um, always something that I notice as being particularly important to me all the way in New Zealand in the middle of the ocean, but we're all a little bit isolated in our own parts of the world at the moment. So it's a good time for us to come together. Um, okay, so um, if, um, if you would like to join the Short Film Conference, um, you can find more information at shortfilmconference.com and it's, uh, there's a fee of 60 euros to join up and then you can participate in um, more of these events. Um, so today we're gonna be talking to four wonderful panelists and um, they're each gonna speak for about 10 minutes and at the end of that, we're gonna have a Q and A session. So if you have questions while you're watching today, uh, please submit them using the Q and A box um, and we'll keep an eye on those and we'll make sure that we ask all of those questions at the end. Um, it's a, a live event with people all working from their homes. So the, it's possible we might have some small children wandering through frame. <laughs> um, this is just all part of the, um, uh, human element of what we're doing. Um, so, uh, yeah, look out for some of that. Maybe um, keep a bingo board handy for um, points for that. Uh, this session is also going to be recorded. So, uh, if you have more people in your team that you'd like to share this information with that couldn't make it today, um, you'll be able to go to the Short Film Conference website or our Facebook page and pick up that file in the next couple of days and um, share it more widely. So I'm gonna introduce um, our speakers now. Um, we have Daniel Ebner from This Vienna Shorts um, talking about his festival going online in May, June. And we have Rich Warren from Encounters and his festival takes place in late September. They're also moving online and uh, researching platforms at the moment. And uh, we have Uli Vigenas, <laughs> and uh, he is uh, from the Stuttgart Festival of Animated Film. His festival takes place in early May. Uh, so he's going to be telling us about um, his custom-built platform. And uh, we also have Lusa Grosjean uh, from New Distribution. And um, she'll be telling us about the relationship between filmmakers and festivals and all the things we need to think about when we're planning our online festivals. Uh, so we're just going to jump into it now. I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Daniel Abner. So um, welcome, Daniel. Hello. So you want me to start right away or do you have any questions? Yeah, um, Introduce yourself, tell yeah. us a, a little about your festival to start, and then uh, you can tell us what your plans are. All right. So, yeah, my name is Daniel Ebner. I'm the co-festival director of uh, Vienna Shorts. Um, I'm very sorry. I have to apologize at the beginning. I don't have any professional presentation or anything. Um, you will see these later. Um, but after all, our festival is still happening at the, um, at the end of May, so rather soon. And... Um, I know it's only online, 
Um, but I think one one thing that we can say already in the beginning, um, it's uh, still a fucking lot of work. So um, uh, whoever thinks about doing this, um, be prepared. Um, right now, I would say we're already in a um, later stage of the five stages of Corona Festival Grief. Um, as you can see, isolation uh, can also lead to a weird beard experiments and um, complete denial about potential weight gains and stuff like this anyway. Um, so maybe just to go through these five stages. Stage one, I think, for us was um, in the beginning of March. Um, it was uh, this, this uh, situation, you can't believe that this is really happening now. You hope that this uh, nightmare will be over soon. You feel with all your dear colleagues uh, who have to cancel on short notice or uh, have to postpone. And you still cling to the hope that um, the end of May is still far away because you don't uh, want to even think about um, that all the work that you've done so far um, could have been basically for nothing. So um, stage two arrives a few days later um, after you start reading tons of news articles, uh, interpreting graphs, uh, learning about contagion curves and uh, statistical scenarios. And um, this stage two is uh, basically acceptance. Um, so let's think about alternatives. What can we do? Um, we were in the lucky position, I have to say, that our main funding institutions said that um, we will definitely get the full amount of funding money that we've been promised. Um, and also that whatever we will do, if it's postponing, canceling, um, or trying some alternative, um, everything would be fine with them. So this helped us a lot um, in the beginning and also thinking about what could be potential next steps. Um, so postponing for us was not an option, um, I have to say, um, mainly because all our employees had already signed uh, their contracts and most of them would not have been available also at a later uh, time of the year. Um, and of course, which date would, you e would even make sense um, to postpone? I think up until now, this is uh, still very unclear. Um, Cancelling would have been a bit tempting, I have to admit. Um, on the one hand, we, of course, we love to present films in a cinema room, um, on a big screen with an audience um, and so on. This would definitely uh, not have been possible. So, um, of course, why bother with something else and try something else? Um, on the other hand, the idea of having uh, one year off also, taking the time to maybe reconsider um, and, and plan things, take a new and fresh look at the uh, old festival. I think that's something you normally don't have much time for anyway. So um, it, as I said, it, could, it would have been tempting. Um, but um, on the one hand, we had already previewed all the films um, at that time. We had already finished our selection. And uh, most importantly, we had also asked the filmmakers already for a uh, submission fees. So we also felt a responsibility to either pay back all the fees, which would have been a huge act actually, um, with around 5,000 individual payments, um, or otherwise um, come up with a, with a proper alternative. Um, and I think there we are now on, at, at stage three, um, the, the main stage and the big question, is there something like a realistic possibility um, uh, for um, an online festival? How could this look like? And can this work? And can this be a proper alternative? Um, so for us, this was the stage of research, of um, thinking about what we would like, of what we would rather not do, of course, also. Finding out what is fair and not fair towards the filmmakers, um, what is good for an audience, um, finding out about the big P's, um, if you want, like the potential platforms, the potential problems, and the potential in general of the project. Um, so, um, again, we were in quite a lucky position that we had some time to do this research, um, not plenty of time, but still. Um, and in these Basically, last two weeks of March, um, we we checked very carefully, like what the Diagonale did in Austria. Um, they were collaborating with news websites and presenting uh, films there, and also with regional VOD platforms. Um, what Ann Arbor did uh, with live streaming from their website or CPH Docs um, with Festival Scope. Um, we were in touch with our partners from Oberhausen, GoShort, and Shortwaves. Um, 
with whom we share the same festival uh, management platform, Film Chief. Um, and um, most importantly, I would say we had uh, plenty of talks with uh, filmmakers and distributors um, for who this uh, situation, of course, was uh, as new as for us. Um, so what are the potential platforms to go to, um, uh, to these questions? What are the potential platforms? Of course, it's existing VOD platforms on the one hand. It could be um, the big ones or bigger ones like Mubi or Festivalscope or Kinoscope. Um, um, of course, it could be the huge ones like South by Southwest did. Then I think with Amazon, um, um, or of course it can be regional ones um, like in Austria it would be Flimit or Cinema VOD Club, um, where basically um, feature films are handled, but sometimes they also provide short film programs. Um, so this would be one option. Another option would have been um, to use existing uh, video platforms um, like uh, Vimeo and Vimeo Live, um, which where there's some costs involved, which can be easily embedded also in your own website. Um, or, and this is probably the, the third option that um, is the most, um, well, most difficult one on the one hand, but also most tempting one, is to build basically your own platform um, which then ideally answers also to all the needs that you might have as a festival. Um, we didn't want to use an, an existing VOD platform. Um, and I think this is also one important point that I would like to stress at this point, um, because for us, it felt like a, a very different uh, kind of thing. Um, festivals are mostly um, the first and often also the only place um, where, where films are presented. Um, they're often at the, or mostly at the beginning of the distribution cycle, whereas VOD platforms are entering at a, a very late stage um, or towards the end, so af normally after the festival run, trying to exploit the film in, in the best way possible then. Um, but we had the feeling that we wouldn't want to mix these perceptions also, and because it could potentially also weaken the position um, of the festivals as the first platform for um, a new film. Um, and secondly, as a film chief, um, our festival management platform is using Vimeo as its basis um, for the online video library already and also for the submission viewing. Um, for us, it totally made sense to think about developing uh, something new together, um, as, I mentioned, as I mentioned before, with Go Short, Oberhausen and Shortwaves. Um, three festivals also who ended up in a similar position um, due to corona restrictions. So we all had, had kind of this need to, to come up with a solution. And it, in that case, it was also easier to just come up with a solution together. Um, so this was the question of the platforms. Um, what are the potential problems? Um, I can tell there's plenty. <laughs> Um, of course, from technical aspects in the beginning, which um, which can be solved. I think this is something um, which is not so difficult from uh, using the, which file you use and so on. Um, um, it can. It is a question how to create something like a live feeling um, when people are sitting at home in front of the laptops and mobile phones. I think this is a way more difficult question um, um, where you can include social media more and where you can come up with different solutions. Um, but this is definitely a dif difficult one. And I think every festival can um, maybe uh, come up also with their own ideas at, at that uh, stage. Um, and then there's also like smaller questions, but also not so easy ones. Um, for example, jury members um, who rather um, would want would not want to stay on board if the festival is only online and you can you don't get a travel or other nice things involved uh, something like that um so there's bigger and smaller questions bigger and smaller uh, potential problems um i would like to talk about um two main questions um um and i think the one question is the question of access um and the other question is the question of rights um and of course in a way these questions are both also connected um but yeah in terms of access i think at at first we had like very high hopes for um a potential audience uh, like way across all borders um but um yeah you realize very soon that this could be difficult um and not only um or mainly because it would be a nice to have thing for a festival but it would not so, would be not so nice after all for the filmmakers um 
for example, if we present an Austrian film, not only in Austria, but make it available worldwide, um, this would then mean, for example, that this film would have no chance to be presented in uh, Locarno or Venice or other festivals than um, uh, in, in the fall. Uh, because they would just not consider the film anymore uh, due to their premiere restrictions. Um, so what we learned on, at the very early stage is um, that the rules from the analog world, they still apply also in the digital world. Um, um, and I think it is important that you think about the filmmakers and their careers um, and to keep that in mind at, at um, that stage. Um, so what we did in, in the end, we, we decided to geoblock um, all the films for a public audience um, and make them available uh, only in Austria. But what we will do on the other, other side is we will provide a worldwide um, access for accredited people, for professionals um, and for the industry. Um, um, so yeah, and uh, the second question is the question of the rights. Um, so what we realized also very early, at the very early stages, that um, filmmakers uh, apparently don't even expect to get screening fees um, if films are presented online or were presented now in, in like maybe also it was in this beginning um, of, of the corona um, uh, restrictions that, it, that there was also not a real idea of what you could ask for and um, if you should ask for money for screening fees. Um, so what we did for films in competition, of course, we also never before, we never provided screening fees um, as they have the chance to win awards. Um, but for films outside the competition, we decided to pay the same amount of money as uh, they would get for a cinema screening. Um, I'm still not 100% sure if this is also fair, um, but I think this is also something that I definitely would like to hear other opinions on. Um, so therefore, we what we need, um, or what what we knew what we needed to provide um, would be a certain kind of exclusivity. Um, so what this is now the connection with the access. So every person who wants to watch um, a film needs to register um, and pay the price for um, of one cinema ticket. This is basically like a festival, an online festival pass. Um, this might not seem much, but it's compared to like 15 euros that you pay for Netflix, it's then again, it, uh, it sounds suddenly a lot. Um, um, but still, you have a certain exclusivity. You will see films in these six days of the festival um, that you would otherwise uh, not have the possibility to see anywhere else. Um, and yeah, so what we will do is we will, pre pre we will present the films um, like in a classic festival schedule. Um, live for the first time in uh, curated programs. We will not present the films um, in like a single of films, but only in the curated programs um, according to a classic festival schedule. And after this premiere um, of the, like his live premiere, we will uh, provide them on demand for 48 hours. Um, so yeah, I think I'm, I'm getting to the end. I think right now um, we're in, in stage four, I would say like going public with our plans and at the same time building the platform uh, properly according to our wishes and our needs. And uh, as I said, growing a beard and uh, a proper isolation belly. Um, and I think stage five in the end will probably just the festival itself and which I'm already very, very curious about. Um, the hub, um, the film chief hub will in the end uh, look very similar actually to the one GoShort is using right now. So this is also something that you can check. Um, um, GoShort, of course, did not have a lot of time um, to build it, like way less time. Um, so it will look a bit different um, at the end of May. Um, and I think it would have been great to hear Kirsten uh, talk today as well. Um, unfortunately, had she, she couldn't make it. Um, but um, yeah, I would just recommend check it out. Uh, the GoShort website also check out at the end of May, um, Vienna Shorts. Um, Tell me what you liked and what you didn't like. I think it's uh, there's. Um, I'm really curious about all the feedback that we can get. Could be very interesting. Um, yeah, and whatever you need to know, uh, check out ViennaShorts.com. This would be the website that would should be in the back now somewhere. But yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel. That was really great. Um, just I'm just going to ju intercede with a couple of quick questions, if it's okay. Um, so the platform that you're using is called Screen Plus, right? 
No, no, we are building our own uh, platform um, with, um, yeah, with GoShort and uh, Oberhausen. It's based on Film Chief, so we like right. it has no real name right now. We call it the Film Chief Hub. Um, so it's a it's a platform that is directly connected to the festival management software that we are all using. Um, I see. And can are you able to tell us the cost of the platform and how long it's kind of taken to to set up and input all the metadata that's required? Um, the cost, I think, is a is a difficult thing because it's of course um, it's a shared cost. Um, so we don't have a final figure right now. We um, we we will find out in the in the course of the next uh, um, uh, yeah next weeks next month um, actually also but we uh, I think we assume that in the end it will be something between I don't know two thousand and ten thousand euros so um, this is what we calculated in the budget also yeah. okay and, great um, yeah and uh, I mean we started with the whole thing in the beginning of um, of April mainly to build it to to implement all the metadata to uh, connect it with film chief and with the, with the software um, so right now it's still developing there's still a lot of new features coming in um, things uh, that we find out bugs that we um, uh, have learned about uh, now uh, I think GoShort has the um, is in a bit of a, a difficult position of course now because they're the um, uh, the front runners and they they are uh, we can test everything um, with them live, basically. Um, but I think you get still a good idea what what the platform in the end uh, is able to um, to provide. Yeah. So we will have to be a bit gentle with Go Short because they're the guinea pigs that are going first. Absolutely, right? <laughs> absolutely. Okay, thanks so much, Daniel. Um, so we're coming next to Rich Warren from Encounters in the UK. Hi, Rich. Welcome. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm great. It's great to Good. have you here. Um, um, looking forward to you sharing your wisdom. Um, first, uh, just introduce yourself and tell us a, a small amount about your festival before you launch into what you're doing digitally. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, so I'm uh, Rich Warren from Encounters Festival in uh, Bristol in the UK. Uh, we would have been having our 26th edition in September, uh, late September this year. Um, I did have an awesome presentation, but Daniel asked me not to do it uh, in case I showed him up. So um, I'm just going to talk to you instead. Um, so, yeah, we so we're not until September, but we decided very early um, to make the decision to move our international competition online. Um, the international competition at the moment, what else we're still kind of working out. But I kind of thought it might be useful for me just to go through my... Um, kind of decision making process and where, where, why we've come to this decision so early um, and how we kind of got there and some of the things that we're thinking about at the moment because I'm sure it's, it's kind of similar questions to what everyone else is kind of going through at the moment. So um, yeah so we like Daniel said we were um, you know we were in Berlin and you could see you could hear um, that the that, 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 that this was on the horizon there was all the rumors about South by Southwest and then it all started happening and you started to see the festivals um, having to um, cancel, postpone, come up with alternative decisions. Um, and it dawns on me quite early that, that, that you know, that in the absence of clarity, there's an opportunity to make your own clarity in these situations. So some of the things we were looking at is, um, it became clear very early on that there was, in September when the festival was planned to be, it was going to be a very saturated marketplace, not just from a film festival perspective and, you know, in terms of the international festival market um, and in terms of other festivals postponing and having to move, but also in a, a local perspective, a lot of the um, activity that happens in Bristol, Bristol's a very, uh, it's a very festival city, but there's a lot of events that happen over the summer. They were all moving to September because for some reason, September seemed like a safe space, a couple of, you know, about a month or so ago. Um, and so what, be, what became very obvious is that it would be a very competitive marketplace and, um, you know, when, when the cultural sector is a competitive marketplace, it's, that it's not a very fun place to work and it's not a very attractive place to, to, to be. So it became clear that we needed to start thinking slightly differently. Um, you know, and completely understand the reasons for, um, cancellations and, uh, postponement and postponement events that like lots of activity, 
as Daniel mentioned, is quite lucky with his funders that have said that you know they're, they're still commit to funding the festival if it moves online. Other organisations, as we heard last at last week's conference, aren't that fortunate and they need to deliver something. So they are financially committed to having to deliver an activity. We're still six months out. We have an opportunity to pivot. And you know, with the support of the funders and, and the partners and the sponsors, um, we, we were given permission to kind of think about things slightly differently. Um, I also thought it'd be very important very early on to give the filmmakers some clarity in terms of what we're doing. We're, you know, we're, the, 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 increasingly the uh, film festivals become a service industry. You know, we're charging for submission fees, we're getting that. We need to have honesty in terms of um, what is coming in and what's um, and what we're doing for the filmmakers. So I thought it was important to get that clarity um, nice and early in, in terms of telling all the film, filmmakers what we're doing and offering them a refund on the submission that they've already submitted to the festival. You know, if they don't want to be online, if they're insistent their films should be seen in the cinema, which we all agree that films should be seen in the cinema, um, then that is absolutely fine. That's, that's not a problem. Um, other things that came into account, you know, was the fact that, you know, the, the, 95% of our audience uh, work in the creative industries, which is going to have a huge hit over this summer in terms of their own financial in, um, income. So will they be able to afford to come to festivals? International travel, what's that going to look like in September? Who knows? You know, so all of these ifs, buts and maybes, it seemed foolish from, from my perspective to be um, striving throughout the whole summer to try and develop an, act, an event or, you know, potentially three or four different events, um, in, depending on the different outcomes. Uh, to yeah, to, to, to be developing all of those when you may have to cancel last minute and or, or postpone last minute, and the impact that would have on the mental health of the team, the the finances, you know, having to go for all of that. So it seemed like a logical decision in my mind to kind of get ahead of it a little bit and create clarity as to what we're planning to do. So the decision we made was to move the international competition online. That's that's the given you know, the the traditional competitive element, the backbone, the spine of the festival, that's going to go online. What that will allow us to do is to be perhaps more reactive with physical activity. Um, so the physical events, need, we can work with the cultural sector where there's going to be a huge rebuilding exercise within the cultural sector with our partner venues, with national and international partners in terms of how we rebuild confidence for audiences to come back to um, the cultural environments. And by, being, by making this decision, it allows us to do one-off events in partnership and collaboration with these, with the venues and the partners and other partners to, in, to see um, if they can, uh, to see if we can support them to rebuild confidence in the cultural sector. So we're still planning on doing physical, physical activity, but it will be much more reactive rather than planning six days of activity. Once we know what the new terms of engagement are, we'll be able to deliver a one-off event here for this community or that community or this community, um, which just to me seems like certainly for the um, foreseeable future, a much more um, engaging way to, to interact with audiences um, where, wherever possible. Um, so that's, that's kind of our decision-making and how we kind of got there. There are other things that we kind of um, took into account, the fact that we haven't financially committed to delivering a physical festival yet. So, there are options, you know, there's budgets and budgets and budgets of how we can do and what we can do. Um, with regards to what we're actually going to do with, with the, uh, the online festival. So, again, we've got a bit of breathing space. There's a lot of learning that can happen with the likes of what's happening with GoShore, what Daniel's doing at Vienna, um, you know, what's happened at Copen, uh, CPH Docs. There's lots of learning and there's going to be even more over the summer, I'm sure. Um, so we can take a lot of that into account. We're already talking with multiple platforms and obviously they're learning as, as well. So they're learning what's happening. But what I think is clear for us is that the online festival will not replicate the physical festival. It is, it's going to be very, very... I, I've, I've, I've Certainly by September when the online fatigue is going to absolutely have set in. I mean, we're all kind of experiencing online fatigue and, and, and you know, not being able to engage with everything that we're seeing coming through on, on the multiple different platforms. Come September, that's going to be even more, I imagine. So how do we um, replicate the physical festival? The answer is we don't. We need to do something different, but staying true to what the core of the festival is, which is you know, providing a platform 
for new and emerging talent in filmmaking. You know, provide giving them an option to profile what they do, what the new talent of filmmaking are doing and how they do it. Um, so that's kind of the starting point we're looking at from with regards to what we do as a festival. We're kind of throwing out all of the rules that exist within a physical festival in terms of like the programming. You know, we have we're not yet committed to a program, so we don't need to do 90 minute programs. We don't need to do um, the, the the 60 minute blocks, the 90 minute blocks. We can move, we can be much more um, adventurous, I suppose, in terms of how we do it, and be clear as to who we're trying to reach out to with an audience. Again there is a trap you can fall into and thinking, oh, because we're going online, suddenly we can reach everyone. Um, you know, that's, that's not going to happen. You know, it's, it, you've, you've still got to reach out to, you know, an existing or a new community out there uh, to engage with what you're doing. So there's all of these things that we're looking to try and um, do. And then the other, the other kind of way that we've managed to get the funders and everyone else on board with, with what we're doing is actually treating this whole process as an R&D process. You know, for years we've all been talking about the fact that we are international festivals and we fly people in from all over the world and the environmental impact of that. You know, we so and and how that what that relates to in terms of us as festivals and what we want to do. So you know, we're seeing this as a bit of R and D in terms of whatever we build and whatever we decide to create this year will have a legacy. And then when the physical festival is able to return, touch wood, next year, we will have a digital option to run alongside it in order to engage with international um, uh, uh, audiences that, that feel like they don't, they can't attend for environmental reasons or don't want to attend for environmental reasons. Uh, and that's absolutely fine, but it still retains the relevancy of the festival, but then also engaging with, um, you know, the, the actual filmmakers that we're profiling at the festival. Um, the other thing we're looking at is, is, is what we can learn from cross sector. I mean, there's a there's a danger of kind of just looking within our own um, community and our own environment of, of, in terms of the film industry, in terms of looking for answers of what we do and how we do it. Um, so you know, the platforms we're, we're looking at, we've looked we've looked at the likes of Shift Seventy Two, event the Eventive platform that's coming through, um, Seed and Spark is with some, something else that we're looking at. We've looked at those, but then we're also looking beyond that in terms of um, you know what is the uh, theatre uh, sector doing? What is the gaming uh, communities doing? How do they work? How do they even engage with, um, with with this space and what's happening? Um, so it's I, I think there's opportunities to, to to think slightly differently about this and see this as an opportunity of not just okay, let's take what we usually do physically and then do that, try and do that digitally because I think that's not going to work. Um, you know. I, I think some of the best advice I've heard about, you know, how to work within these, these environments at the moment is, you know, is know that whatever happens in the future is going to be different to what's happened before. So you can't just stand still expecting it to be the same, but then not everything will change. There will still be some um, consistency as to what's happened in the past. So you can't go running far too fast forward. So it's getting that balance and knowing where you are, um, I suppose, with that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, pretty much what it is. I've seen a couple of questions come through, so I can potentially start looking at those if you like. Um, we're gonna wait till the end for most of the questions. Wow. I don't think there's any that are specific for you, so I'm gonna save those to the end so we can ask all of the festivals together. Um, so thanks so much for that. That was great. We do have quite a lot of questions, but I'm gonna come back to those. So um, if anyone that's, um, attending has more questions just pop them in the Q&A box and we're going to get to all of those um, yeah that was super interesting um, maybe you could just um, Rich tell us um, which other specific platforms that you're looking at at the moment so I mean yeah I mean I don't we've got we've gone through quite a few and I don't want to kind of say we've looked at that but we've dismissed that dismissed that because it might be good for someone else but yeah and I, I don't want to you know be mean about any platforms that aren't suitable for what we're thinking about but I mean certainly some of the front runners that we're looking at at the moment um Eventive who we used as our box office system last year Ido uh from over in the states uh we we worked with him last year on a, a um on a box office system and they very quickly developed a a uh, virtual festival platform, which allows for Q and A's, it allows for um, streaming of planet, uh, panel discussions and in, embedding stuff into into that. So it's certainly doing a, ticking a lot of the boxes that we we're, we're wanting to look at. Likewise, um, Shift Seventy Two, who came in halfway through CPH Docs to kind of 
because uh, they were originally using, I think they were using um, Festival Scope, originally CPH stocks, and they shifted over to Shift 72 halfway through because uh, it had a bigger capacity. Um, that's a really, really slick system, really, you know, really interested in what they're doing. In terms of costings, I know people are interested in costing. I mean, it's, it is really, you know, stick your finger in the air because a lot of it is about how much you want to ingest into, this, into the system, how many films you want to put in there, and then streaming costs, paying per stream. So if you have a super successful platform and there's loads of people watching it, it's going to be more expensive than it is um, to not do. But I mean, at the moment, ballpark figure, you know, we're looking at about the same cost of, of, of what we pay for venues is what we're prepared to spend on, on a, um, on a uh, platform. So, and, and that's coming in about right in terms of what we're looking at. Okay, great. That's really useful. Thank you so much. Amazing. Um, so we're going to move on to our next panelist. Um, we have uh, Uli from Stuttgart Festival of Animated Film. Hi, Uli. Hi. Um, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your festival before you um, jump into your presentation. Yes, so thanks very much for inviting me. So my name is Uli Wiegenast and I'm the Artistic Director of the Stuttgart Festival of Animated Film. For quite a long time I'm involved at the festival, uh, since 1993, so it's really very long. The festival has been founded in 1982, but it's the 27th edition. So um, in the beginning it was biannual and since a few years, since 20 years it's, uh, it's annual. And yes, it's an animated film festival in, in Germany. We have around 100,000 spectators. I can just show you an image. This is a, do you see the screen? Do you see? We do, yeah. So this is uh, just uh, the uh, open air situation at the moment. Um, so yeah, we have like a huge public part on the main square of Stuttgart and indeed we have the normal kind of um, yeah, uh, uh, cinema situation. So that's uh, our base at the moment. So I try to, I hope I can go back. Yes, so so now we also had to cancel like all the other festivals in Europe and worldwide in March 13th. It was Friday, March 13th. Uh, we had to cancel and indeed we already knew that we have to change uh, the festival from analog to digital. So there have been a few concepts um, uh, that we already developed uh, because we knew we can't do the open air situation with 10,000 people per day. So we start with the preparation of the digital version maybe three weeks before. And uh, our festival starts in, on f May 5th. So it's just two weeks to go with the festival. So it, like uh, as Daniel said, um, yeah, it's plenty of things to do to install the whole concept. Indeed, like all the other festivals, we are experienced with digital platforms and we have our, our own um, online animation library. But indeed, now we have to face different uh, questions in regards to the uh, audience. Indeed, we have the platforms for professionals and aggregated people before, but now we have to go to the public and how could we present this virtual edition? So I show you another file, let me see. No, that's, that's the wrong one. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, one, one second, sorry. Uh, I just hop here. Okay, you got the... Um, Charts? Yep. Okay. See you see. So uh, this we had yesterday. We had a press conference. So <laughs> this is like the uh, just the beginning. But uh, I think more interesting for you is how we prepare um, everything. Uh, we have um, all together. We have um, uh, three parts. Um, sorry, I just hop here. So we have um, an online festival free part with the live streams, interviews, panels, um, music videos, uh, with editorials, um, written articles, interviews, and the game zone, which is a quite important part of the festival. This is for free. Um, I will talk later about the live stream. Indeed, we have all these questions of right clearance, scale blocking, etc. pp. But the live stream is real life for um, uh, six days with moderators and program 
live program from 12 to 12 a.m. to uh, uh, 11 p.m. Um, I go in detail um, with the next uh, slides. Then we have online festival plus. It's like as uh, Rich already said like um, a platform where you pay an amount uh, nine uh, nine euros uh, to yes uh, VOD um, uh, films uh, most of them are exclusive and uh, also some um, European premieres uh, feature film premieres so it's not only short film indeed feature films is much more tricky in, in terms of, of rights and what we did is uh, we included video statements um, uh, for the um, by by the filmmakers and and for the children films we have like special material uh, like uh, for for teachers and, and parents that they can use these materials when the kids watch the film so far we have now we have 170 films on the VOD, uh, I, but I'll go in depth uh, a little bit later. And then we have the Online Festival Pro. Uh, there are master classes with the professional talks and the link to our um, animation production days uh, platform. It's a business platform, which is also a Creative Europe funded for, for animation and you have access to this uh, Online Festival Pro. But, um, that's another uh, team who is organizing the whole thing, so I can't talk about the business part uh, in, in depth. And we have the animated video market, which already exists uh, since 15 years, and this is based on, on good old Newport technology, and uh, there the um, professionals can watch the um, uh, around 2,000 films which have been submitted um, uh, to the festival. So that's the uh, the general concept. Uh, if I, then we go into that, uh, like we have this kind of um, live stream. So there's a structure um, starting with uh, master classes and, and workshops by international animators, screenwriters, producers. Uh, that's uh, like 60 minute um, talks um, or presentations with Q and A. Then we have family program also with kind of workshops for children, how to create an animated film, short films, talks, etc. Then we have a structure um, with, with the, like mixed talks. That's uh, the most difficult thing. We are in English and German, so we have regional guests. We have a little studio, what is also quite complicated because there are the regulations because of uh, Corona that there are not more than five people can um, be in the studio, so we have one camera person, three cameras, one operator, one continuity, one uh, mod moderator, and one guest, and a lot of uh, Zoom uh, and video conferencing. But there will be live talks in the studio, there will be live video talks and recorded talks and keynotes. And then we have a kind of an evening program. Um, we really have to build it in a very short period of time, like four weeks. So this is like the structure, like a thematical evening uh, with some Oscar-nominated film, Oscar uh, films, because we are an uh, Oscar-nominating festival. So we thought, okay, Oscars, that's for the general audience. It's maybe not so original and new, but I think for the normal audience, um, that could be interesting. And then we have the Focus France and um, as a special day for games and music and animation. And we have the award ceremony. And that's maybe interesting for you to know how we handle uh, all the competitions. Indeed, our uh, pre-selection has been finished and all the competition programs we have six different competitions with the prize money around 70,000 euros, all have been selected. So what we do, uh, we ask um, all the um, selected films and the right owners if they would allow uh, that we include them in the password protected um, uh, online festival plus. Indeed, not all of the right owners um, could allow this. Um, so around 60% of the, the right owners agreed. Um, but what we did else, we promised all uh, the filmmakers and all the producers that the whole competition of this year will be shown at the 2021 festival too. So next year, we will reduce our special programs 
And we have two parallel competition screenings, the 2021, if it comes, and the 2020. So, so therefore, uh, for I think the filmmakers, we can invite them, they will be present. Um, I think it's a good sign for the filmmakers of the 2020 competition that they will be in Stuttgart in 2021. So there will be two parallel competitions. Uh, so we run, in a way, we run two, two festivals. And we start with the award ceremony, the physical award ceremony, as the opening of the festival. We, we uh, have uh, the award ceremony of 2020 with the physical presence of uh, the animators where they pick up their little statue. Uh, by the beginning of the 2021 festival. So there's not a real opening, it's the award ceremony of 2020. And then indeed we have the final uh, award ceremony of the 2021 uh, edition at the end of the festival. So it's a little, little bit of a strange situation, but I think it's also quite funny to start a festival with, a, with the award ceremony. Um, yeah, so 60% of the filmmakers um, allowed to, um, to put their films uh, in the online festival plus, um, let me I jump. Um, yeah, so at the online festival plus, as I said, 117 films will be available. The base um, we did not to use an, an already existing platform, but I'm really keen to know what system is working good. So we are working with Vimeo, with a Premiere account, and with our web um, um, company, we handle the login management and the payment um, uh, management uh, with Stripe, this kind of credit card system. So this costs around 10,000 euros uh, uh, to build up uh, this Vimeo account and we had already all the material like um, synopsis uh, still so at the moment we're in the process to fill um, this little database um, with the 100, 170 films and in, indeed it's also important to to have these films if it comes to funding and as you know European uh, Community and Commission Europe allows um, to run a virtual festival that is really nice so that they allow to change the festival from a real festival to an online festival but you have to have uh, the amount of films like you, you all know this 400 films etc et pp you have to include them in the festival so we have a little pressure to fill this database or fill the stream with um, uh, European films. But this is uh, the online festival plus. I think at the end we will have around 250 to 200 film, short films and maybe 10 feature films. We are still dealing and it's a lot about geoblogging indeed. Um, yes, and uh, different right issues. So this is the plus um, area. And in the free area we have our game zone, but it's maybe not that interesting for you. Uh, with uh, yeah, different uh, key nodes and panels and the children areas. Um, so this is the um, uh, game zone. Yes, here are the, the selections so far. We could uh, uh, secure the rights of those films um, and hope uh, that we include maybe four or five more feature films in the plus section. Um, and indeed, a, a lot of films from uh, older festival editions like Marion Max um, and Arugas from Spain, uh, which also won the European uh, Film Award. Yeah, and then we have the um, uh, Pro. This is, um, yeah, there will be um, VOD um, workshops, um, talks. Etc. A lot of film schools are involved, like London National Film and Television School, Nanchang University, Singapore. I'm, me, myself, I'm also a professor at the Film University of Babelsberg, so my colleague Christina Schindler will give a talk. And we have the, the access to the um, um, uh, online animation library and the animated video market. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Um, we, we need to um, move on to the next panellist shortly. Can I just yes. ask you a quick question yes. while you're talking about the live events? Um, which, um, 
which platform are you using for the live events? Are you using, say, Zoom or Facebook Live or something like that? So we have, at, so far we are using two systems uh, like Zoom for, because it's the best quality if it comes to sound. So, and for very easy and fast uh, video conferencing, we use Google Hangout because you don't have to download the software. So um, that's uh, much, much easier. So um, these are the two tools, but indeed we are still uh, trying out and, and there's a lot of rehearsal at the moment, and we will see um, yeah, what what comes out at the end. But uh, so far we use uh, Zoom, but we try to pre-record as much talks as possible, because in a live stream, um, indeed, there's always like a difficult, difficult situation if you include uh, uh, live video conferencing systems. For sure. Thank you so much. We're going to move on to the next panellist now, but we'll get, we're going to have lots of questions to come back to you. Um, just before I introduce the last panellist, um, in the Q&A box uh, where people are asking questions, we've just um, given people permission to upvote questions. So the questions that you're keen to hear um, most at the end, you can give them a thumbs up um, and they will um, uh, be bumped up the list just in case we don't have time for all of the questions. So it'll make sure we get to the most important ones. So I'm going to introduce Lucy now. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, it's great to have a distributor here to um, answer some of the questions everyone's going to have about how filmmakers and distributors are going to think about this whole online process and how we can work together most effectively. So thanks for joining us. Please introduce yourself and uh, yeah. tell us a little Thank bit you about very... Sorry, it's lagging a little bit. Hello everyone, I'm really happy to be part of this uh, conference. Uh, I'm Luce Grosjean, I'm running a uh, Miu Distribution, which is a sharp film company uh, specialized in distributing animated sharp films. So um, I have a little presentation, so I just need to remember how to change my screen. Uh, I think, yeah, I think I'm going to have my presentation up. So yeah, I wanted to speak to you a little bit more about the way we are dealing with all this situation right now. Um, and how it's impact our work and the distribution. Is it like a uh, full, like, is it okay for the screen? Uh, uh, yeah, we see it. We can see the, um, the menu down the side. Um, is it better? So oh yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> okay. So yeah, so to start with uh, a little bit about what we have to deal with, I will just uh, remind you what is our business model, at least for our new distribution. We are making a living by uh, asking fees for sending films to festivals. We are renting films to theaters or to festivals when films are out of competition. And we also do sales and TV channels and VOD platforms. We are taking for the last 2.30% of all the incomes, but the rest of the incomes most of the time are paying for submission fees to, for the festival directors to festivals. So right now the situation is quite impacting us a lot. So we have 20% of all the incomes of the company that are not going inside of the company where a really small uh, company and uh, we have like only 5% of public fundings which is uh, especially for our sending French films to international uh, festivals and yeah so that's how it's like day to day impacting us uh, we also work a lot online and uh, there is a business model online and for example we are putting films on Vimeo which is mostly for fame because we don't get any incomes from that but we also work with video platform, VOD platforms sorry, uh, that most of the time are geoblocked on certain um, geographical territories and we are also putting our films on uh, VOD Vimeo platform but this is more or less only for uh, having the films not uh, getting pirated when we have like Oscar season or uh, Caesar seasons. 
We also started to put our films more and more on YouTube, uh, which is really the beginning of something that we're trying. Last six months was just the beginning of that, and we made uh, 4,000 euros, more or less. Uh, then, what is our work right now? We are still like sending films to festivals all the time. <laughs> Because uh, yeah, we we are still preparing all the festival submission for like fools. We have to do to deal to deal also with all the festivals that are getting cancelled and refund the renting fees that we already received. We also have to deal with all the premier uh, statues of films with festivals that are getting postponed, and also we have to deal with all the festivals that are going online. So I'm going to detail a little bit more what we have what we are doing right now, but it's a lot of work. So most of the people uh, who is uh, running festivals has been in touch with Laure, my dear colleague, uh, and whenever a festival is getting online, they will receive some questions from her. The question will be if the screening will be geo-blocked, uh, I will detail why, if the screenings are password protected, if there is still a competition, and if there is any budget allowed. So to explain you why we did we do that, uh, geo-blocking is really important because of course rights already have been sold from our films and we need to know what we can accept and what we can give you um, to festivals to screen our films. For us, it's also really important to know if there's a limited number of tickets that can be sold, uh, if there's any renting fees or if there's a revenue split, if there is a lot of uh, tickets sold, that would be interesting. And how long the films are, are will be available, if it's only during the duration of the festival, or maybe 48 hours, uh, this is a good element that we need to know for making our decision. And if the film is already online, if the festival can use our links, uh, if there is still a competition, and how the jury will judge the films. And if the film would be screened as a program, or maybe only films per films. That means that maybe people will just watch the film they want to see, and that's not the same way that a festival is running right now. So it was really interesting to see how Rich was uh, going to, to do that uh, for Encounters in December. And we are really like, we don't really like when there is no geo blocking, that's really depending on the festival notoriety. And I can explain also a little bit more why. If there is live stream session of the programmation. If it's on Facebook, on YouTube, it can be really tricky because our films are protected online. So we will have to deal with all the protections and maybe also with music rights and stuff like that. Uh, if uh, the competition is totally open, that's something that we may refuse. If festivals are requiring old films that already have been running well in festival and already online, uh, that's can be something that we don't really like because, for example, the films we're more like promoting small festivals and like being showing new films that maybe need more exposure. And uh, I don't see my window, so <laughs> I don't see what I put behind, but we really think that festivals should not be like uh, cheap TV or VOD offers. Um, then of course, our decisions will be totally different from what films we will be selected. For example, if the film is already online, it will be less tricky. If uh, the festival has a really specialized target audience, it will be also easier for us to take a decision. If the film has been, has been pre booked or booked by a TV channel, that will, we will need to take decision about if we should ask the TV to accept or not this uh, offer. If the film is ending right now, the career, its, ca its career, it will be less tricky. But if the film didn't start its career right now, we might postpone it. Uh, and if the film didn't work well, it will be also easier to accept to show the film uh, to a festival online. And if a film is too experimental or too long for internet audience, we may we may also rethink about the fact to accept a selection in the online festivals. But in any case, we will listen to directors' wills. Uh, if they want to be screened, what they are like looking to do with their film and what will be the best for them. 
Um, so I have some examples of festivals who have been doing like uh, proposal that we accept. There is a lot of good proposal and the festival directors that was speaking before also made some good presentation of a good way to have online festivals. Uh, so Aspen has a number, like limited number of tickets they can solve during the festival. It was only uh, visible on USA and you only have the possibility to see the film during the duration of the festival. We also like the example of South by Southwest because uh, it was kind of creative in the way their offers to show the films online. Uh, they offer us quite important license fees. Uh, they were working with MailChimp, uh, so we also thought that they will reach a big audience that we don't reach normally. And it was only for one month worldwide, but yeah, the, the amount of money that was offered was also really interesting for the, the rights that we didn't solve already. Uh, we also received some not that great exam like proposal to have films online, like without any password, visible on Vimeo's accounts of the festival, and like we're kind of using Corona as an excuse of, yeah, you should give your film for free, and that was not okay for us. So we are still trying to help directors to understand what is happening right now. And we also try to find the best way for them to uh, show their films. Uh, we are try, like we are changing our point of view on that every week and every day. So uh, it's good to have this uh, conference so we can still like rethink and, and see how we can improve that and how maybe people will watch films the next six months. Uh, we really want them to reach the next step they want to reach on their career and that will also push us to give them uh, any advice on how they should show their films. And yeah, we, we are still the gatekeepers of the market and we will try to find the best way that we can still make everyone have their film screen uh, in the best circumstances and yeah, and that the audience can find and discover the films. So at the end, we are really hoping that this old experience will help us to reach new audience. We are really looking for when a festival will share their data uh, at the end and see if, uh, uh, like how much did all these online festivals work. Uh, I really hope that all the festivals that are postponing their events uh, in falls will coordinate to each other. I think uh, that was also Rich that was speaking about the fact that we are all trying to maybe uh, take less flight. And if we can all try to make directors tour during their festival experience, that would be great. I still have in mind this beautiful uh, still from a short name corner. And I think it's a point we should all try to reach. But more than everything, I think I cannot wait to be back in the cinema theater and watch films. And I think we will all have to deal with um, our little local audience. And, and I will try to get back to my window. Uh, I don't know if Nils can help me on that. But uh, I, I really hope that, yeah. We, we will be really creative and, and we will find a way to find this whole local audience that is going to be driven to discover more short films. Yeah, we hope that too. Thank you so much, Lou. So that was great, uh, very informative. I'm gonna jump straight into some of our questions now. Um, so firstly, I wanna um, come to Daniel. Um, uh, one of the questions is, um, have you had any filmmakers withdraw their films now that you're moving online? Uh, no, actually not, not a single one. Um, we, um, but also I think because we took uh, like very much into account what we heard from filmmakers and distributors before. Um, and because we like what, what we had from uh, two or three filmmakers was the feedback that um, that they have a bit of problem to have it on demand, even though it's just for 48 hours, um, like 48 hours is for them fine, 
but to have to film on demand um, sometimes especially if it's a more um, difficult subject um, or um, um, if it's kind of also maybe exposing a, a, a person to a bigger audience than it would be in a cinema room um, um, then there is uh, yeah then we have this this talks but everyone agreed that now that we know that you have to uh, register before that you have to pay a certain fee that you have to um, like um, do a certain um, or, or give a certain effort um, to get to this uh, uh, place like everyone agreed in the end um, so it we, we were very happy about that um, actually Oh, that's great. And um, while I'm asking you questions, can you also tell us um, how you're handling geo-blocking? And uh, so my question is, um, who's your target market for the festival? Is it your same audience? And um, part of that question is, are you geo-blocked just to Austria? Yeah, we are just geo-blocking to Austria. Um, so, I mean, Austria is a bit of a, it's a small country in the end. So, um, and I think the main uh, film industry um, is happening in Vienna. So in a way we are targeting uh, the same audience, but what of course, what we would like to try, we, we had um, uh, visitors uh, sometimes from, from Vorarlberg or from Tyrol, like from the Western part of the, of the country coming to the festival for spending the whole week there. And I think it, it is a possibility for us to expand also to an audience that would normally not um, maybe take the effort and come to Vienna and um, uh, do this travel. Um, so I think and I hope um, very much that there is an audience out there that is generally in very much interested in maybe like um, art house film um, has is maybe a bit bored already by uh, the Netflix offer and um, is willing to to uh, watch films that is um, yeah um, that are a bit different than than what you would get normally on, on, a, on a VOD platform but having said that we are also very curious how it will um, work with an audience because it's at the end of May beginning of June the restrictions are already a bit uh, loosened up people are going outside it will be warm um, so I can also imagine that it might be difficult to uh, engage an audience um, properly at, at um, like for the live uh, uh, streamings. Um, yeah, um, we, can only, we can only hope for this. It's so hard to predict this um, weird in-between phase, how it will yeah. go. Um, I want to come to Uli now um, and ask you the same question. Have you had some filmmakers withdraw from your festival um, now that you're going online? Yes, of course, because some of the films are really restricted to online. As I said, 60% of the filmmakers allow to use the films um, online. Indeed, we have this uh, geo-blogging question and we are not uh, that strict. We have individual geo-blogging, especially with feature films, but in the online festival Pro edition, um, most of the short films are not geo-blocked, so therefore we totally understand uh, that 40% um, of the, the right owner said um, that's, uh, we can't do it because of different right issues, that's fine for us, because we all the films uh, which will be uh, in the competition, also those films which are not on the online festival have their jury uh, process, so they also win an award in Stuttgart, even if they are not in the online session. So the um, uh, announcement, the ceremony, the online award ceremony, um, everybody has the same chance uh, to win um, the awards. But uh, geoblocking, that's what I'm really interested uh, in, in the different systems you are using. Our system, because it's like a, a customized system for every film we have to pay like, um, 300 to 400 uh, euros for the geoblogging issue, and that's quite a lot for a short film. So therefore, I'm really keen uh, to know more about it. And uh, who are you specifically targeting for the festival, for your viewers? Who are you specifically targeting as your audience for the festival? Is it the same as your normal audience? Or since the films are a bit more widely available, are you also kind of expanding that? Um, I think, uh, that's just an expectation. I think that 80 to 90% will be our usual festival goes, but indeed 
if we reach out, we will find some uh, new audience. But uh, because it's a mixture of local events and German talks in the stream, um, so it will be more a regional audience. But indeed, if you go to the pro section or the plus section, that's international, internationally open. So we may find a, a, a bigger audience. Yeah. Okay, great. I have another question, which is, um, is there a possibility for filmmakers to get feedback from the audience through one of the, um, the platforms or systems that you're using? So yes, we, we pay uh, flat fees like we often do because it's like uh, we pay an am amount and um, the platform is open from 5th of May to 10th of May. So we pay uh, uh, fees, different fees, indeed, uh, if, if it's a feature film or a short film, that really depends. Um, um, it's more exclusive rights, if not so, it's uh, quite individual like uh, we, how we handle the fees, but there's like flat fees uh, involved so far, not like that, uh, because we don't know how many people will use online Festival Plus. We, at the moment, we like, I think maybe 200 people will be there. And, and if there's like more, uh, uh, if they're like more than 1,000, indeed there will, will be an additional share. So far we pay this kind of flat fees, but- Can you, know, you, um, can yeah. you, um... Can, can people who are watching the films give feedback about what they think of the films using your platform? At the moment, uh, that's not possible. We were more interested to have the statements of the filmmakers. Uh, what I find quite interesting that for every short film, we have like two or three minute statements of the artists. So you get this kind of live feeling. Um, so that, that the audience is, is in touch with them. Indeed, it's also a question of, of money. There, there are some some tools with a with a WordPress system. What we are using to have a interactivity, but at the moment no feedback um, uh, for for uh, at the online festival plus um, situation. Okay. The film uh, and the statement of the of the filmmaker and some uh, material for, as I mentioned, for, for children. Okay, that's great. So I'm gonna go back to Daniel now. And uh, the next question is, um, uh, are you worried that some viewers of the festival might buy like a uh, pass that allows them to see a lot of films and share their password with um, other people viewing? Is that a concern? Uh, it's not a concern because it will not be possible. Um, like you, you can um, uh, you can share your password, but it can only be used once. So um, you you have you have your own personal um, access code and um, a registration code. So it's not really possible. Um, of course, uh, you could someone else could log in with your um, with your email address and your password, but then um, you you couldn't watch yourself. So um, it's not a real concern, actually. Okay, I wanna come across to Rich now. In your research, is that something that you're worried about? Um, people kind of buying a pass and sharing it around with their friends? No, I mean, everything, everything that we're looking at at the moment, um, all the different platforms, all the different um, sites we've got, they kind of, sophisticated enough to allow for you know limiting the number of um terminals that can that can use a specific site or the number of people that can use it at a specific time so you know there is um i think those those kind of issues and those kind of worries have been uh changed uh changed up um you know in in recent times you know since we last had a big kind of revolution in terms of looking at digital technology likewise you know with piracy and things like that and, and, you know, and even the terms of, you know, I just heard what Uli was saying regarding geo-blocking, uh, you know, and the cost of geo-blocking. Certainly some of the um, platforms that we've um, been talking to have all uh, got that integrated in terms of options and, 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 it, no, and, and not looking at a cost per film being much cheaper in terms of how we do that. So, I mean, they, and, I, and I think there's going to be a lot of learning to be happening. I mean, currently everyone's talking about geo-blocking and how that would impact the, um, the different kind of, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at all the comments to mention the change of location. <laughs> Boots down by my wife. Uh, so I'm, I'm in the kitchen now. Hi, I can pick you up something. Um, so yeah, it, it's uh, certainly everyone, like, everyone's talking about geo-blocking now, but I think, you know, there is an opportunity to do, think about things slightly differently and think about how 
um, we can do that. You know, and in, and in terms of your audience and who you're engaging with, I mean, I think there is a need for there to not be geo-blocking when you're talking about the industry audience. And like um, Daniel was saying, in terms of the accredited or the industry audience, you do want those guys to interact with you to maintain that relevancy as, you know, as a, as a festival with an international reputation. But, you know, we so all... Is it your intention, Rich, to probably do geo-blocking for your normal um, viewers and to have some kind of component of the festival where accredited industry guests can have access to, um, to the program and, and meetings and events? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yes, maybe, don't know. Um, I mean, I've got the time to kind of look at what's going on. I mean, probably what we're going to be looking, looking at is several different options, you know, where there is the international competition that is geo-blocked and is go, does go out to a, you know, a um, national audience in terms of who we, who we largely engage, engage with in the UK, which is mainly, you know, up-and-coming filmmakers. Um, you know, let's not kid ourselves as to who comes to the festivals. Yes, there is a general public audience, but a lot of that audience that we get that are interested nationally are more from the, you know, from the, the from a filmmaking perspective themselves. But yeah. then I think there is another offer in terms of what we uh, in terms of what we do as festivals and how we collaborate internationally. And it may mean that we, you know, again, it's about not trying to replicate the panels and masterclasses and, and everything that we would usually do at a physical festival, but think about what actually an international offer looks like so that it isn't replicating what everyone else is doing because if we all end up doing exactly the same thing online it's not really a marketplace it's just a load of the same thing yeah i think you're um that's a real relevant point there is if um if we all end up not geo-blocking and doing the same thing then we're all suddenly competing each against each other that we've we've never done before so it's all a little bit scary i want to come back to you now early i have a couple of questions that have come through for you um the first is why you decided not to geo-block um your screenings was that because it was too difficult with the platforms you were using or did you decide that on purpose uh, there Different questions. Um, one uh, reason is really that we are like uh, we just had a, a very small amount of time to develop the whole thing, and we talked with our uh, um, company, IT company, and uh, it would be too costly for us uh, because they told us per uh, geo blocking it's like 500, 400 euros per film, what is quite a lot. So um, therefore, we decided if the if, uh, films um, and um, producers uh, uh, geoblogging, they are out in uh, the online festival. But we thought, okay, we have uh, we show all the films next year, so they are like um, they are still in the competition. So that was the main reason. But uh, I'm still open, uh, maybe Daniel, uh, for your uh, geoblogging solutions. So if you if you can. Um, yeah. inform us how you manage the whole thing and w uh, with which system you are doing the geo-blocking um, that could also help us uh, because we're still in negotiation with some of the films and um, would like we'll, to help um, them. We'll put you guys in touch afterwards so you can have a bit more of a chat about yes. that yeah. and um, we probably will do another one of these conference events um, later after a couple of these festivals have happened so that we can get a bit of feedback from people on how they went and some went and some more learnings. Um, so I've got a question for Lucy now. Um, that is, um, how are you dealing with um, films for festivals that have been cancelled? Um, uh, what are you doing? Um, how are you? Um, how are you communicating with the filmmakers about that and coming up with a new strategy for the films? So we have three case scenario. In fact, uh, so we we have the films that already had their life in festivals and. Uh, like, for example, films that has been starting last year with ANSI and all the fall season of festivals. So, which for us, it's quite okay to see them right now in festival online. Uh, the most difficult part is for films that started their life in January and then everything collapsed. So, they're like, I've been seeing their like no premiere, international premiere and stuff like that. So for us, it's really hard to find a good solution. So it's really case by case, films by films. And, so uh, do, you, 
Have you made a rule um, about premiering films that you're saving those premieres for festivals that happen with live festivals or are you relaxing things to allow for online festivals to have premieres too? So for films that already have been screened, for example, at Berlinale, uh, right now we just like let them be selected on online festivals and we are like not trying to care much about premieres because it's too hard and we don't know what is going to happen. Like I would love to be able to keep some premieres in for Indie, Indies Lisboa or like for German festivals, but it's really, really hardcore because we don't know if they're also going to be postponed or like if festivals are going to exist in like fall. So there I don't take any decision, but for films that uh, were maybe hoping to be screened uh, in June or May, uh, like in a big festival in France, uh, we are just like not releasing them right now. We will see, we'll, I, yeah, we are hoping to things to be normal again, or maybe try to find a new way of being creative, but yeah. yeah. This, this is for me the big question. I don't know for the, like, the rest of the directors, but yeah, I think. Yeah. And, and there is one thing I, I wanted to say because from the last uh, edition of uh, Virtual Short Film Conference, people were speaking about the fact that directors cannot shut their films right now. But I really think that all the animation film directors are still doing animation, except for like maybe stop motion. So maybe festivals would be crowded of animation. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, um, I want to jump back to Daniel now. Uh, do, have you had to relax your rules about accepting films into the festival or allowing them to qualify for your awards if they've screened at another online festival? Um, uh, we had. Um, in a way, um, like normally we would have the rule that um, uh, international films should have the Austrian premiere um, at the festival and national films um, should have at least a Viennese premiere um, um, at the festival. Um, I mean, if you go online, this suddenly just feels completely stupid um, to talk about premiere rules. And I also saw that there's um, like um, in the Q and A sec section, there has been another question, like if there will be a change in this um, system also, like if uh, um, the premier rules will be um, abandoned in the future. Um, I, I think it, this, it is an interesting question now that we all go online and that we suddenly start to compete um, across borders, um, which um, is a bit uh, scary also because of course the, the bigger festivals suddenly can, um, uh, can develop a, a way bigger uh, profile suddenly also across the borders and it, makes, uh, it might make uh, lots of the festivals, of the smaller festivals, um, like look only for local or regional options suddenly um, and not um, being kind of uh, um, uh, relevant maybe also in a, in a, on a bigger scale. This could um, happen. I'm a bit um, uh, worried like if, if we all start to have our own online platforms, if we suddenly just um, uh, start to um, destroy each other instead of um, supporting each other, which I think uh, the, uh, is the, the, the main reasoning also behind the short film conference. Um, I lost a bit of track of the question. I'm sorry. I think I went somewhere else. But um, It's okay. I think you answered it. I'm going to ask you another one quickly, which is um, what um, ticket price are you setting for, for tickets? And um, what kind of audience numbers will you be happy with if you, if you achieve them for the festival? Are you still there, Daniel? I've lost you a sec. Uh, we seem to have a bit of a bad connection there. Um, we're gonna jump over to um, Uli. Maybe you could answer the same question. Um, how much are you charging for tickets and um, how big of an audience are you hoping to get for the festival? Yeah, that's a really, uh difficult question because we are not experienced with uh, this uh, form of digital festival because it's not a platform which is like on a monthly basis like Netflix and uh, and so on. So we have just these um, 
six days. Uh, so we charge uh, 10 euros for the access of online festival plus. But we have no idea. We calculated just 100 viewers at the moment. So because we don't know how much uh, people really uh, will go to online festival plus because we have also the screening program with the interviews and also with the short film. So a little bit uh, we cannibalize ourselves. Uh, but uh, the, the festival stream, indeed, there are older films, but there's also one premiere German short film at the stream. So indeed, it's a question how you deal with premieres. Um, so yeah. at the moment, uh, we just uh, we experience 100 spectators use it, so very small amount. If it's more, that's good. Um, as I said, we pay this kind of flat fee, and if we like uh, have 1,000 viewers. Uh, indeed, we would share uh, 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 the money with the um, participants and the, and the right owners so far. But we are very skeptical about it. We, we can't say anything about it. And as uh, Rich also said, um, we are st now we are in the phase that people are a little bit fed up with live streaming and all these uh, uh, offers. Uh, and there will be some... Um, other possibilities now for the people they go out and um, they want to enjoy the sun and we have a lot of uh, streams now and I'm not sure if this really works even at the beginning of May so we'll see. Okay so great, we've got, thank you. We've got Daniel back again. Do you want to ask questions <laughs> about, um, about how much you're charging for tickets and um, how many audience members you're hoping to get? So we will um, ask for the amount of one cinema ticket, which um, we're not 100% sure yet, but it will be around 850 probably um, for the whole online festival pass. So you just register once. Um, it can also, I can also answer Uli's question from before. Um, the geo-blocking works uh, for us via the payment system. So it's not via the, for the films, but it's via the payment system, which is easier because then you, um, you know exactly from where the p uh, person is uh, coming. Um, um, and um, in in terms of expectations, it's really really difficult. I mean, we have a a rather experimental um, uh, program. Also, have uh, experimental competition. We watched the or I watched the programs of um, Ann Arbor that was live streamed in uh, mid and March, and I saw that they had something between two hundred and four hundred viewers, but it was screened worldwide. Also. Um, uh, or live streamed worldwide, so I'm. Uh, I would hope for numbers like this. I think this would be beautiful. But I'm also, um, as Oli said, um, I think in terms of of uh, the weather and the circumstances at the end of May, it might be a bit more difficult also to um, to reach that many then on the same at the same time. But I think also this is why we offer not only the live streaming but also the 48 hours of on demand afterwards. So that people then can at least catch up um, in in the two days after. Great. Um, did you want to say something else, Uli? Just, um, just to add, um, what we now are planning, we will have a cooperation with a drive-in cinema. So one day during the festival, we have the program in a drive-in cinema, so that we are negotiating. And the other thing, we are now planning what is more difficult and costs around. 20 to 30,000 euros is like a mobile LED system where we show our live stream in different parts of the city every day in a different part of the city. That's an idea. Um, we have to raise the money and there's only two weeks to go, so uh, we will see. But I think it's quite important that you start to get back to real life. Even you have live stream and all these things that you develop strategies, how you can put the workshop back to reality. Great, um, I just have one final question and then we're um, about out of time. Um, and uh, maybe Rich, do you wanna answer this first? The question is, uh, do you think that this um, mass use of online and all these big changes that are happening in our industry will change how we organize film festivals forever? Um, we're obviously all learning a lot of new skills and changing the way we interact with our audiences. Do you think it's going to have long-term impact? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's foolish to think that this isn't going to change things. 
forever. I don't think it will change things drastically. I don't think we're looking at a completely different future, but I think it's foolish to think it's going to be, we're going to, once this is all over, we're all going to be back to normal. I think there's an opportunity to change things for the better. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to, um, you know, look at things slightly differently. I think how, I don't think festivals will permanently become online. I, I think, you know, the, the physical festivals will return. We all know there's, you know, a lot of festivals now, you know, so it's, it's we need to be doing something um, unique each individually. And this gives us more of a um, mandate to do some stuff differently, perhaps. But I think, yes, it will, it will be different, but I don't think it will be drastically different. Some things will be different, some things will be the same. You know, there's my non-sit-on-the-fence answer. Thank you. And, um, Lusa, I have the same question for you. Is this um, going to change um, the way that you interact with festivals if, if, if online is kind of a thing of the future? Yeah, I think uh, it will totally change the way that we can interact. I think we already have some directors who were like thinking of traveling less to festivals um, because uh, for ecological reason or because they have families and they will have to learn how to use properly uh, their webcams and stuff like that. So I think this is the skills that all directors will have to to work on right now. And and yeah, and maybe a totally different way of sharing their love for their films. I think I still need to receive some videos for early festivals and a lot of them still didn't prepare them. So <laughs> I, I think we, yeah, if they want to, to share better their films, they will have to learn fast. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Uli, what do you think about the long-term changes for us as an industry? I think it will get much more hybrid. I, I think that's a good thing because before Corona, we already talked about sustainability and indeed festivals are platforms of bodily exchange and it's still important, but um, we also run different conferences uh, on architecture and you invite an architect from, from the United States flying in and business class, he's giving a talk 30 minutes and then he's going back. So in a way that doesn't make sense. And as we see also now with the virtual conference, it works in a way and maybe sometimes it's more structured. So I think festivals will be more hybrid in terms of digital and analog so but in fact it's communication is also a bodily thing so the only, it will go back to an analog but uh, there was some aspects like conferences and uh, and keynotes and things like this um, i think it's not, not necessary that we travel around the world every week so then you may pick up the things you really want to to yeah. where you want to be Great, thank you so much. And the, Daniel, uh, do you want to answer that question as well? Um, are you excited about all these new changes that are fast coming your way? Um, I got a bit more excited um, in the past weeks. I, I was very skeptical in the beginning. I also am still um, not 100% uh, sure if this will be um, like a big revelation or a big, um, um, yeah, like, like, uh, a disaster i don't know um we i'm really curious how how it will all uh, go but i agree with everyone uh, before and i think like one thing that also lou said in in her talk um i find interesting is that i think we it will not only go towards uh, like an, an hybrid state um it will also the question will arise like which films um work better and would you program other films um in the in an online setting because um like we we were asked a lot from journalists now um, if we would have done a different program if we would have known that we were online um, at the end of May, and I'm pretty sure that some films um, will have a very hard time um, in an online screening, um, even though it's a curated program, even though it, they fit together. But um, for for some films, they need the cinema screen, they need the big screen, they need a, um, a, a focused um, um, screening possibility. And for other films, it's it's uh, it might work way better on an, in an online setting. So I think it, it's um, very much and also like which films um, fit in which uh, in which context and how do we how do we um, think programming and curating maybe also in a new way. Great, thank you so much. 
So many, um, there's lots of questions that we didn't get to. Um, so I just want to suggest that um, people can ask those questions on the Short Film Conference Facebook page. Um, and we'll do our best to um, ask the panelists or other members to answer those questions. That's a really great place to kind of keep the conversation going. There's so many facets of this new world that we're all learning. So hopefully we can help, help each other. Um, Thank you so much to all of our panelists um, today um, and tonight it's night where I am. So um, I really appreciate your time and sharing all of your wisdom and thoughts with us. Um, I did forget to introduce um, Niels Putman, who is um, from the Short Film Conference, who is um, here with us as well. Um, Niels, do you want to say a quick hello and how people can ask you about um, joint, becoming a member of the Short Film Conference? Sure. Um, just <laughs> write me an email at newlatshortfilmconference.com. It was really interesting hearing you all talk, so uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, he, he wasn't expecting to talk. Sorry, Niels. To <laughs> <laughs> you can send him an email or you can find out more information at shortfilmconference.com. Um, so we hope we'll um, find some new members. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in and joining us. Um, we'll post this video online so you can share it out. And uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. It was great to be able to share all this information with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.